everyone we have deeksha malik with us uh, on for a webinar today on career opportunities in employment law and um, employment law has been a new and emerging practice area uh, at various law firms and i'm going to have a conversation with her because she's been working in this area for a while now and she's a young employment lawyer and <clears throat> i i would really be interest i'm i have invited her here because she can share a young lawyer's perspective who starts working in a new area of law and on the challenges they face in that okay so we invite sometimes senior lawyers sometimes uh, principal associates sometimes uh, lawyers with about a couple of years of experience and the reason we do this is to ensure that you know uh, the the people who are here are able to convey both a high level perspective and the experience from a young lawyer's journey of growth okay so uh, deeksha would you like to share a brief background about yourself with everybody hi everyone um, so abhyudeh has already given a brief introduction but i would like to uh, elaborate further so um, i am uh, currently working with khetan and co as as part of their employment labor and benefits practice uh, i've been working with them for 2 years now and uh, yes as of you they rightly mentioned i'm a young lawyer so may be able to provide some perspective from uh, from a young employer's side but um before uh, joining the employment practice i was working with the capital markets team of the firm so like any like like most law students um who are interested in corporate law so to say um i was also more inclined towards corporate um that is one area which uh, many law students um, wish to um venture into uh, while they are in law school so that is exactly what i used to think as well that maybe corporate law is the thing and uh, maybe that is something i should try so when i joined khetan and co i joined uh, the capital markets team which also used to deal with certain corporate aspects um but uh after a while i realized that uh, um corporate law as we study in law schools is very different from uh what is there in practice that's the case with other laws as well but what i'm uh focusing on here is the diligence aspect now uh the corporate teams in almost all major law firms do not focus a lot on the advisory side um their focus is essentially on the um diligence, diligence side absolutely so um i think that was one thing which i was not able to relate to because i'm inclined more towards advisory um aspects and that is when i realized that maybe corporate is not uh, my cup of tea and that's how i landed in the employment team and i had absolutely no idea about the practice because again like most law students um i was not exposed much to this field in fact um, labor law was just one one subject in a trimester and um, there are around 44 uh, central laws so you need to realize that one trimester or one semester is not enough to to study labor laws so it was obviously uh, taught um, very hurriedly i would say in haste and uh, that is why students often are not exposed to the practical nuances of this subject so we right. would we would uh, memorize sections under the factories act minimum wages act having no clue mm. how, how these things actually pan out right. in the in the actual uh, um in, in the practical side um right. and uh, let me also tell you employment law is not just about having a thorough knowledge of uh the labor laws in the country it's also about people management right because on a day to day basis we are dealing with um with the relationship between an employer and an employee um sometimes we have to deal with the uh, exits of senior uh, personnel including managing directors of companies and uh, and often um what happens is you know every situation is different from the other uh, some sometimes we would see amicable exits of these senior people sometimes it would not be so amicable uh, there would be certain uh, friction between the management and the concerned employee so how to deal with communication between the management and this employee who they are 
planning to um, you know um, whose services they are planning to terminate okay. so let's come to the issues that you deal with as an employment yeah. lawyer on a regular basis in a short while uh, but i'm really interested in your journey as of now you started as a capital markets lawyer you said yes i joined as a capital markets lawyer uh, okay. eventually ended up in the employment practice and okay. uh, since then i have been working on a diverse set of areas now as i mentioned um, i was not really exposed to the subject at all but mm. within two weeks of joining this uh, practice i realized how diverse this practice is mm. and mm. it's very unfortunate that Got students it. are not exposed to this area Got it. Got it. yeah so, yeah i think that's very important because when you are consulting when any of you uh, here are consulting clients yes. you will feel this that uh, they are going to come up with issues which you consider are actually contractual mm-hmm. which will look like which will be labor law issues or related mm-hmm. to employees and you'll be like shit i never studied labor law in college yes. and in college what happens is that a lot of times you don't actually uh, you're not taught these practical things you will study about what is an industry what is an industrial dispute you will study about maybe the bangalore water supply case and uh, who is a workman but uh, from an industry perspective how employment laws apply that is not dealt with in college so yes. there can be some struggle about that but we'll map that okay we'll shortly go about to map that what yes. i'm saying is that how did you get to shift from one practice to another like did you say i did the other firm say that we are having a new employment law, uh, law practice could you like to shift or did you do you like how does that happen and are they now even uh, looking up for freshers who want to join in directly at the employment law team what's it like because there are people i speak to young lawyers who are interested in employment laws and mm-hmm. they they want to know whether there is any opportunity for freshers to directly step into it and i've spoken okay. to someone senior earlier in khetan and who had told me that usually how the practice was set up was mm-hmm. like when clients for corporate teams of mm-hmm. who were sending their queries from m and a transactions like there would be an m and a transaction there'll be an employment law aspect so usually yes. what happens is that the general corporate team deals with the queries that come out from here Absolutely. then employment law queries started being specific and so it became it spun off into a separate practice area and so there were people who were doing corporate work but they started to move into the employment law practice now now that the practice area has emerged and people are looking at uh, specifically having this then uh, are there fresher hirings and all of that can people choose at the time of internship that i want to work in employment these are some of the things we want to understand on a preliminary basis and then we can dive in into the content of uh, what the opportunities are sure so as you rightly put uh, abhi there uh, even in khetan there was a never a dedicated employment practice until a few years ago um, there was there's one partner mr anshul prakash who was part of the corporate and m and a team and uh, he um, uh, told us once that um, while dealing with all these corporate aspects he would receive a number of employment related queries and there would often be instances where the entire diligence is um affected because of major workforce uh, issues uh, trade union problems because they were not uh, agreeing to the proposed uh, transaction okay. so um slowly yes and slowly uh, these issues became very specific uh, requiring th- uh, there to be uh, a specialized practice in the firm and that's so when there was a need felt yeah Hmm. So, so from time to time, I was in... on the role of a student also. <laughs> I will interrupt and ask you questions. I hope you don't mind that. So, uh, the source no of questions were, uh, it one source you said is at the time of diligence because when there's a big factory, a company being acquired or invested into, and there's a big factory in the picture yes. or or trade unions, then you can't just do a regular labor law checklist while at diligence because you need to manage if any industrial disputes arise. so an employment practice yes. was directly feeding in into the transaction itself yes yes and then if you want so, to fire uh, let's say key executive same problem absolutely right? absolutely okay, go, ahead. go ahead and explain this yeah yeah so um, again uh, in one of in one of the transactions we we recently witnessed that um, uh, it was a government company again and um, there of course uh there was not just an acquisition there was an aspect of privatization happening as well now of course i mm. cannot uh, uh, divulge the details but when no when 
when when there is a privatization happening you need to realize that the that the the, the rights and entitlements available to a government employee is those, those are significantly different from what um rights and entitlements there are with respect to private sector employees so of course people who were i think you are speaking about uh not just a psu but it could be a government department or a government undertaking which yeah. the government wants to corporatize absolutely so, so how it, this works guys should i just explain them how the framework works legally in terms of benefits sure sure no problem we might just connect with it so so everybody like there are government has these services right civil services and all of them where you have a specific kind of pay commission these kind of things are there this is for the government services similarly now government departments which operate as undertakings they have their own system okay so no industrial disputes act all of that they try to separate that out from there and then there are psus where you will have industrial disputes act trade unions bargain collective bargaining all of that applicable and that will be on par with the private sector most of the time except for the fact ki government ka to politicize yes. zyada ho sakta hai but government psu and private sector will be the same but a government department or undertaking can have separate pay scales and things like that okay and the government service itself will again have a separate uh, public service commission which will determine terms so these are the three functions when you look at public or private sector entities for labor laws okay yeah go ahead teacher and correct me okay if i get right. uh, if i get it wrong absolutely so um, again uh, as we mentioned that because the rights and entitlements are different of course the employees were not uh, were, they were wary of uh, what benefits uh, they, they will have once the corporatization so to say happens and uh, they are moved to a private entity so of course we had to manage this not only from the perspective of assessing what their rights would be subsequent to the transaction but also um having a conversation with them prior to the transaction trying to have them on board uh, trying to uh, have their confidence also in the transaction assuring them that even if the entitlements are different they would not be adverse to uh, them so uh, this is one nuance i uh, i i would like to highlight and uh, similarly there were several other issues that were coming up and that's when there was a need to have a dedicated employment practice uh, in the law firm and uh, just to i think 3 4 years back only we had this developed dedicated uh, employment labor and benefits practice now again uh, for the past 2 years um, there were just three people in that team including the partner himself and of course students were not uh, very keen on moving to this practice unless they really want to run away from the practice they were working in and they had they were just desperately trying to move to some other team that could be one reason why why would why they would want to move into employment but otherwise uh, for the simple reason that they were not exposed to this practice uh, as part of their law school or as part of their internships um, they were very of what would lie ahead and um, this is exactly why when i was asked uh, to to choose uh, other teams where i would want to shift from capital markets i did not did give it as a request on on your or you were asked on your own i i i obviously placed a request uh, but um, uh, i was asked to suggest certain options and um, i suggested all those cool options that are available such as competition practice ibc as you would um, see a lot of students are writing articles on on uh, in this area um, participating in moot court competitions in this area so even i was very interested and i suggested that as one of the uh, preferred areas but i never chose employment back then as well but okay. uh, yes but there was a special request from the partner that uh, they really need a, a junior associate in that team and uh -huh. uh, that's when i was asked to try it out uh, okay. for a month and uh -huh. if i don't like it then maybe i can request for a team change again and as i said before within 2 weeks of joining this uh, practice i fell in love with the with the kind of work uh, we do here and that's when i decided to continue with this practice and i would say that i'm um i'm totally not regretting my decision i'm very happy with the uh, with the practice uh, we are doing so one quick question yeah in your employment law practice on a day to day basis i don't think that you can be oblivious of corporate law although your main work will not be corporate law anymore but i think there is an element of corporate because i i've heard a lot of people talk about this that you know i hate corporate law i want to go into employment law 
and i tell them this in the employment law practice is going to be inside a corporate law firm that 80% of their work is corporate law so you might not be an expert at it but please don't say that you hate it it's a uh, yes. employment law is like a little branch of corporate law so yes. uh, you have to sit inside that and do it so you can't be somebody who hates corporate law and therefore i'm going to join employment law and i heard somebody from a some uh, one person i was speaking to she went in an interview and it said that and she was not sure and after this happens people never get to know why they didn't make it past the interview so <laughs> just keep in mind everybody that you know it is not employment law practice is not a rebound from corporate law <laughs> if you get for interviews or applying <laughs> okay and yes. uh, so now is there that kind of system that if somebody specifically chooses that i want to apply to cop uh, to employ employment law practice for an internship Yes. Or for a job, then you know, are those kinds of systems available at least for an internship? Just curious. Um, yes, these opportunities are now available to students because, uh, of course, even we need uh, the assistance of juniors on a day-to-day -day basis, and uh, it's not very easy to get interns on board. So, um, of course, the demand. Yeah, is there's high. no background in law school, so. Yes. So the. Uh, we all do feel the need for interns, huh? of course on a day to day basis because there's a lot of research involved so yeah. unlike unlike the corporate practice there is a lot of advisory work here um mm -hmm. um whether it's about um, um the statutory compliances yeah. or it's it's about even um so it's not just strictly uh, the the 44 central laws i mentioned or the state laws we also mm -hmm. deal with the employee stock options which is again yeah. a corporate law aspect but pertains yeah. to uh, employees and that is why the employment lawyers come into picture now there are uh, a lot of pop yeah go ahead go ahead yes now uh, employment um, uh, whether it's employee stock options or other uh, incentive plans um, there there is a lot of research involved because these areas are not really um, um, these are new again and um, the, the, we we receive a lot of queries from even startups who uh, who would want to come up with the best employee incentive program and that's right. when we need the assistance of interns and uh, the demand is really high and the students are not um, i mean the number of students who would be interested uh, uh, in joining would be less so of course mm -hmm. um, um, even the hr is um, uh, accommodating if there's any intern oh wow that's great oh yes i'm going to send um, some your way <laughs> so accommodation uh, in a in a corporate team is very difficult these days because everyone wants to venture into that field but if you're interested in employment law and you place a request before the hr that you specifically want to uh, work with this in, in this area they would definitely accommodate because this is a relatively new practice uh, still flourishing um, yeah and uh, booming so uh, these these uh, requests are definitely accommodated um, right. uh, another aspect i would like to highlight here is that given this is a niche practice you won't find dedicated employment practices in all major law firms the yeah. three um, law firms that have a very good employment practice are nishit desai uh, tri legal and khetan and co um, as okay. far as yes as far as other uh, major law firms are concerned uh, be it siril amachan mangaldas or azb um, as we uh, discussed before as well uh the corporate partners themselves deal with the uh, these employment related issues but you won't find a separate practice so as i mentioned in the tier 1 you have these three um firms and um, also i would like to highlight that all the, the three law firms i mentioned they do not have a pan india presence uh, for instance if you see tri legal it is considered one of the best employment practices in the country but uh, it is focused majorly in the bangalore region so you won't find a, a an employment practice in their uh, bombay office or their delhi or gurgaon offices so um, again it's very region specific um khetan is one exception because it it has recently developed its employment practice in um, delhi and bangalore as well uh bombay always had one i mean for the past few years so um that's that's the scene uh, with respect to the top um, law firms so you now, said khetan tri legal nishit desai yes any other law firms they should know which are building uh, so anything as, like, yeah yes so as far as um, uh, my limited knowledge goes here um, i 
heard that uh, um, Shardul Amachand and Sirsa Lamachand Mangaldas are also trying to build an, a, a specific employment practice. But as as right. things stand today, these three are the uh, relevant firms where if you want to really uh, build a career right. employment law, you should look out for opportunities. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, when somebody is building, let's say, an employment or practice, a new firm, okay, and as we just discussed that it's a spin-off from a corporate practice. Yes. So I think in that position, it could even be, so first the partner will be doing the employment work within the corporate practice. Yes. So if you have an associate who says that, sir, I know a lot about employment law, you can quiz me, these are the things I've worked on. So yes. I can as well handle all the employment law queries you face. That kind yes. of a thing can work out, right? That will really uh, hold the person in good stead. Absolutely. See, uh, uh, as far as the firms where the, ded the dedicated employment practice is not there, there uh, what happens is that, of course, when you join as an associate, you are expected to work um, on corporate law related aspects as well. But slowly as you build your, um, um, I mean, you find a way into, your, into the team and um, uh, you get one or two matters initially and you do show your, your interest and worth in this area then the then the partner also accommodates your request and starts handing over more employment related queries to you so mm. but that happens over time uh, uh, you need to realize that when you join the firm you cannot uh, make an immediate request that you know i'm just going to handle employment law related matters that doesn't happen unless i'm talking about khaitan trilegal or nda which do have dedicated mm -hmm. practices mm -hmm. so uh, uh, you cannot as abhyuday mentioned you cannot ignore corporate law related aspects even in khaitan for example now i am dealing with a, a dedicated uh, I'm dealing with dedicated employment queries, but often I have to uh, open uh, the, the companies at Bear Act and uh, read provisions and analyze cases because um, uh, I may be confronted with the situation relating to managerial remuneration, right? Mm -hmm. Now, this is one aspect which um, flows from company law, but because yeah. Uh, the KMPs are also employees uh, considered in certain situations as employees of the company. So uh, uh, there are employment law nuances as well. So I need to uh, have a thorough knowledge, not only of employment law, but also of corporate law. And Hello, let's take this now. Uh, go ahead, go ahead. We'll take the issues now. We'll map every yes. issue. Yes. And uh, another aspect where, uh, which I mentioned before, employee stock options. Again, this flows from the companies act. Uh, and if it's a listed company, then you will have share based employee regulations of SEBI also coming into picture. So I need to factor those aspects while I'm addressing queries um, uh, of, of, of a senior HR personnel. Okay, so I'm going to start mapping this people are getting really curious about what happens in employment law okay so yes. Deeksha, let's just do this together in a conversation um, okay. i want to categorize this okay the first set starts with um, executive compensation and managerial remuneration yes. so uh, companies act regulates the amount of money taken away by directors and key managerial personnel when the company makes a profit and yes. when the company makes a loss okay yes. and this is for public companies not for private companies for private companies this is different uh, you that is not regulated but when you're dealing with in a big law firm a lot of your clients will be pub public companies and sometimes a private subsidiary of a public company is to be treated as a public company so yeah. keep in mind that these aspects get regulated then esops is something that you will deal with with respect to directors also and employees also if it's listed then there's sebi regulations if it's not listed then there is uh, companies act related rules now, it's ESOPs, sweat equity, there are concepts like phantom stock, and uh, these are basically fictitious ESOPs, where you basically just look at the profits and then you divide it notionally amongst what cash equals to which person and you pay it out in cash. Okay, so there's no option, no letter, no instrument issued. Okay, this is the corporate, uh, this is the side of for directors, then there is uh, there are severance compensation related provisions under the Companies Act. So which tells you that if I terminate a director's employment, how much severance compensation can I give them? The philosophy behind this is that a director is in a senior position. If you terminate him, unlike a regular employee, he will find it harder and longer it will take to get a substitute job. 
So the Companies Act says, what is the severance compensation to be paid? Then there are questions on, there is a, an issue about clawback clauses. Like imagine a CFO who's also a director does some uh, creative accounting and later on he is required, the company is required to restate its accounts because the accounting wasn't done properly. So the question will be about whether because of the uh, director's fraudulent accounting practices, we have suffered a loss. It looked like a profit and the director got incentives based on a profit, which he showed only because of his messy accounting. Can we take it back from the director? It's called a clawback clause. Yes. Okay. So this is with respect to directors that comes in. There may be others. So what else comes with respect to directors? Diksha? So I'll just keep blocking it uh, each part. So this is with respect to corporate and directors. Yes. Uh, Diksha, yeah. Other part. aspects uh, also. So um, on this part, is there anything else with respect to companies and their directors that we face? Um, yes. So then again, with respect to whole time directors, because they are considered as key managerial personnel, of course, mm -hmm. comes to a public company, as you mentioned, there are limits on managerial remuneration. Then yeah. there are uh, disclosure requirements as well. Uh, okay, for yeah. example, uh, I need to mention, uh, I need to disclose to my shareholders as to what's the ratio uh, of compensation that is being paid to such personal as opposed to others. Mm -hmm. And um, you will often see that um, uh, the, the ratio is such that the significantly high payout uh, uh, severance compensation being paid to a whole time director when that person is leaving the company as opposed to um, a, a, a person in the lower uh, rungs of the company. So um, these aspects are very important. Uh, uh, you, there are certain disclosure requirements that you will find under Schedule 5 of the Companies Act. So that you need to keep in mind. I won't venture into this a lot. No, we, but, do, we don't need to go into the Schedule 5. We just need to identify the issues so that people know what we need to take care of. Yes. For those of you who want to work as freelancers, offer this to startups. That will be fun. Yes, okay. Absolutely. So uh, apart from these company uh, law related issues, what um, also we um, uh, uh, deal with from, from, from the perspective of a senior managerial personnel, uh, key managerial personnel is uh, the conflict of interest issues, uh, issues relating to non-solicitation, non-compete. Now, uh, again, uh, sometimes you have a provision in your Okay, again, the, the status of a director is uh, something that you need to uh, assess on a case to case, case basis. There are certain uh, cases um, where it's it's been held that a director can be an employee of the company. And um, it obviously depends on the terms of uh, engagement. So if there is an employment agreement executed with a director, where it's the, the, the terms and conditions are very similar to those of an employer and employee, then you could uh, basically infer that there is an employer employee relationship between the director and the company. And in that case, uh, you can subject the director to certain um, um, restrictions, which are typically imposed on an employee. Now, um, these could be non compete, non solicitation. Of course, it's not yeah. that uh, you cannot. Uh, otherwise, okay. so you cannot subject uh, a director to these uh, clauses. Director become an employee if he's a whole time director and serving the company in some capacity. Na? So they will give him a designation and have a separate employment okay. agreement also. Yes. So especially with respect to a whole time director, because that director is required to give uh, his full time to the uh, to a particular company, right? As opposed to other directors. Now, yeah. with such kind of directors, you will enter into an employment agreement typically, um, and in that agreement, you will have certain uh, post uh, a termination restrictive covenants such as non compete, non solicitation. Now, uh, let's see, we let's say we have such a contract in place, and. Yeah. Uh, and then subsequently uh, a whole time director leaves the company or, or is in the process of leaving the company. And at that right. time, uh, he's, uh, th there is a background verification done by the company and the company come, comes to, to uh, it's, it, it, it's informed by an external source that, you know, this person is planning to leave your company and is planning to join one of your uh, clients. Perfect. So, clients. Yeah. Yes. So in that case, how will you handle the situation? Um, uh, will you sometimes we send a cautionary letter to the concerned employee saying that we caution you against joining um, 
it's come to our knowledge that you are they're proposing uh, planning to join one of our clients and uh, it's going to impact our uh, reputation um, i mean uh, it's going to impact our business interests and uh, therefore we caution you against um uh, joining this uh, particular client or else we would be constrained to um to go for the legal recourses available so sometimes uh, things get sorted out at this stage itself sometimes it doesn't it reaches the court and then i need to uh, get an injunction against the uh, against the concerned person now again here there are certain things you need to keep in mind not all restrictive covenants are enforceable after termination right um, non solicitation has been held to be enforceable but non compete yeah. isn't right so um, these finer nuances also you need to keep in mind yeah so, you can see those of you who are interested can see uh, the Vishal Sikka's uh, employment agreement with uh, Infosys that was disclosed by Infosys to SEBI. So you can see how they said that he is not to join only five of the companies after if he leaves Infosys. So people have been very careful to keep this restricted and as narrow as possible. Yes. For one complete clause. And also remember that executive employment agreement drafting is very different from your regular employment agreement drafting. Your regular employment agreement will be. basic okay and people may not want to pay for it but or they'll pay you like small money for it but if you are drafting an executive employment agreement that needs a lot of attention to shield the company absolutely to shield the company or to shield the executive whoever you are acting for and the people who could be your clients are usually companies as an employment lawyer workers or trade unions are unlikely to be your clients if you're a law student then feel free to help them that will be a great learning perspective but if you are a lawyer your client is going to be a director or an or a or a uh, executive employee a rich employee who has been deprived of his stock options or it could be the company okay these Absolutely. are the possible clients you will be working for Absolutely. So, if you are working in a law firm, uh, especially uh, one of the top law firms, your clientele would essentially comprise of companies. Okay. Um, of course, there could be a, a very senior uh, a, a personnel also approaching you because that person can afford uh, the cost, um, the, the 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 lawyer fee. Right. So, um, this these will essentially be your clients. You. won't expect trade unions or junior level employees coming to you unless uh, you want to pursue an independent uh, career um, where you have set up your own practice and you are uh, essentially dealing with employee related uh, issues and you will uh, in bombay itself we uh, have a couple of uh, lawyers who have set up their independent practice and they represent employees before courts uh but again from a remuneration perspective if you really um uh, i mean you 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 cannot expect a lot of money coming from uh, such clients and uh, clients um if if um, if you have set up your independent practice where you are dealing with queries from employees then the money coming in won't yeah. in especially in your initial years won't be as yeah. a uh, significant as it's there in the law firms right but in your so initial uh, stages you can make this thing uh, you can make employment policies you can give standard yes. executive employment agreements to the company who has come for you Absolutely. that will that will work and so if you catch the startups early as they are scaling up see as yes. a law yeah, lawyer you will be able to identify which is a company which has a model that's going to scale and which one doesn't so if there's a company which is scaling up meaning which is reliant on investment to grow and which is getting revenues you know that this will either succeed or go bust and so they are going to be willing to pay for the work that they need done so they're going to give you work like drafting various employment policies there are about 15 to 20 employment policies in any organization that you can draft you can draft posh policies you can draft code of conduct whistle blower policies and yeah, yeah the employment agreement the employment agreement will be separate for top level executives separate from for regular employees you can draft yes. consultancy agreements you can draft consultancy agreements for work from home employees these are a few types of work and in case of uh, industries where ip is important you can draft work for hire agreements okay in in yes. a creative industry yes so there are some examples of work uh, that you will do now we just covered the corporate part at the moment and we have not even co- covered the actual labor law part okay but yes. this is itself a huge area for lawyers so uh, should, we, should we go to the next part diksha is there anything you want to add on to this part or should we move to a, another part no absolutely we can move to the remaining 
portions. The, the labor law portion. But you yes. said the source of this, there can be two sources of this, right? One is that when there's an investment transaction and there's a diligence going to happen. So yes. this, this could really like uh, snowball. And the yes. other one that uh, from on a regular basis over the lifetime of the company's affair, uh, business, queries yes. arise from time to time. Ki somebody has done this, somebody has done that. So mm. help us out. And yeah, the litigation side of this is that when you go to enforce a non-solicit or you go to enforce somebody who has leaked a trade secret and there are many cases where you will see where an employee or a consultant has, uh, has divulged trade secrets and the courts have given an injunction okay, from disclosure. And non-solicit right. also was uh, upheld in one of the cases. There's an old case. It's there in our labor law course. I don't remember the name of the case. But... Uh, one company basically was asked to stop soliciting the employees of another company, but an employee was not prevented from applying on his own to the other company who, which was working. Okay, right. so when a non-solicit is extremely important, is that when to work with an employee, okay, who leaves, so he should not solicit somebody else out of the business. And another situation where two companies are working together, let's say in a joint venture or in a collaboration, there you don't want one company's management to poach another company's employees. Okay, so there, this has been held to be enforceable. Yes. Okay. And there are nuances as to how and when it is enforceable and how it is not. So that condition right now, I'll not explain because we'll go into a lot of technicals at the moment. Uh, the next part is the shops, uh, the commercial offices part and the regular labor laws compliance. Okay, so if you're in a corporate office, so I know some parts of it because I teach in the labor laws course and uh, Diksha, feel free to add modify whatever you feel appropriate. Sure. So in the, in the corporate office, you will have uh, regular shops and establishments applicable, which has your uh, daily hours of work, wages, attendance, deductions, all of that. So some of the provisions correspond to what is there in the Payment of Wages Act. But Shops yes. and Establishments Act is primarily what you need to see. Sometimes there is a problem like in Karnataka where, you know, People say that IT industry, maybe whoever is working is a workman, if they're getting below a threshold, in which is there, ki if a person does X kind of work and earns less than this, then he's a workman. Now in Karnataka, you have an exemption that if you are compliant with POSH, you have ABCD, then you do not need to be worried about Standing Orders Act. The issue with somebody being a workman is that he will need standardized contractual terms, which are applicable under the Standing Orders Act. Now, what happens, you must have remembered in your contract law class that employer-employee situation is one where one party is unequally placed, another party is at a higher bargaining position, right? So there was this whole discussion on unconscionable terms, unfair terms and all of that. So how the law standardizes that is by saying that you need to actually have certified standing orders, which are the standard terms of contract that you execute with workmen. And these need to be certified by the labor commissioner. Okay, and that is how this gets equalized. And anytime you change your standing orders, you will give your trade unions or the workmen an opportunity to oppose and the labor commissioner then certifies based on this, the amended terms. So any additional terms that you add have to be consistent to the standing orders. If there are a modification, someone can argue and challenge that this was not a part of the employment terms. Okay, guys, I went really fast, but could you all follow? Diksha, please uh, let us know if like, where you see this playing out because see i've done this from research i've asked a lot of hr managers have seen these questions arise okay but feel i am not i don't deal with the law firm aspect of things every day so you can please add to from your experiences where you found this sure so um, as far as the commercial establishment so labor law um, uh, is labor laws are bifurcated essentially between two kinds of establishments one you have factories Okay, this is a very broad classification I'm talking about. You have factories and then you have commercial establishments. Okay, now, um, yeah. and uh, so factories would basically cover those establishments where a manufacturing process is being carried on, right? Yeah. Now, this again is a very interesting area because manufacturing process has been very widely defined. And sometimes, and th this happens a lot of times during our diligences that uh, you know, uh, the, the client, the concerned company, the target company where, on which we are conducting diligence has not obtained uh, a factory license 
for its warehouse okay because it has taken the view that in the warehouse only certain goods are kept that they are stored now we are not basically conducting a manufacturing process there so we don't need to get a factory license for this particular warehouse um however if you see the case laws that have de developed thus far you um act courts actually take a very wide view of manufacturing process and they say that anything that forms part of this manufacturing chain um including storage of these finished products uh, this would be considered as part of manufacturing process and therefore you should obtain a factory license if you haven't then of course there are um Uh, criminal liabilities under the act although they are not really enforced in practice but they are there under the factories act so this is with respect to factories act um covering men, um, entities which conduct manufacturing processes now other uh, commercial establishments for instance your information technology companies um hospitals um and educational institutions now all these will be covered under shops and establishments act of the respective state now uh, what you need to see with respect to a particular jurisdiction is that whether its shops and establishment act covers your establishment in the first place right so there are um, certain states as abhyudaya mentioned in karnataka you will see a specific exemption um under shops and establishment act for it companies so um you need to first see if the act actually applies to to your establishment so there is exemption from shops and establishments also for it companies um yes so if you see um the the relevant provision it says uh, so but of course um, in in practice you see that the labor uh, inspectors actually try to enforce those provisions because there's nothing that is really governing you other than the shops and establishments yeah, because they got exemption from standing orders if they have a employee code of conduct and a posh policy right see if you see the maharashtra shops and establishment act also it says that establishments set up for the care of um of people who are um i mean um uh, uh, medically unfit um uh, those those commercial establishments will not be covered under the maharashtra shops and establishment act but if you see the case laws courts have given a very restrictive view and said that hospitals the commercial hospitals which have been set up to earn profits they are not exempted from um, from the applicability merely because the statute says um institution set up for the care of the sick right and you have to give a very restricted meaning to this um, a particular provision and uh, this would essentially include charitable institutions um which are set up for the care of um of of these people right so you have to see the the case laws also that have developed but yes there are certain exemptions with respect to certain kinds of institutions under each of the sne act um and also there's another kind of exemption that you will often see in shops and establishment statute which is with respect to persons occupying managerial position so all your key managerial personnel even your full time director even if you call that person an employee that person will not be governed by the shops and establishment statute because of the express um exemption that is given to these people of course haryana and there are certain other states also where there is no such exemption and uh, it is i mean you theoretically you can take the view that even such senior people are covered under the act so these final nuances also you need to keep in mind Got it. yes okay so this was about uh, shops and commercial establishments then we move to the factories part yes so uh, as i mentioned before um factories act essentially covers um the establishments that are set up uh, to carry out manufacturing processes and um, uh, often uh, what we um, um the, the queries that we often encounter is whether uh, um an office that has been set up quite close to the factory premises um which is not carrying out any manufacturing process whether uh, for that you need to obtain a shops and establishment certificate or whether it would be covered under the factories act itself so again courts uh, have actually uh, and this was actually one of the issues that we recently encountered because uh, we had um um azb as one of the uh, law firms and uh, they took the view that you know you should have taken a factory license for this particular um office but we analyzed uh, a lot of cases 
and uh, we formed the view and we shared this view with the client and eventually we were able to um, uh, conclude the deal and we took the view that um, the the kind of functions that were being uh, carried out in this office this office was essentially set up only for uh, for um, um, for carrying out ancillary activities with respect to the factory in question um, there was no other purpose that this particular office was uh, serving other than um uh, other than assisting what was happening in the factory premises um right. so that is one the kind of functions that this particular office was doing the other aspect was the proximity test okay so well, um, uh, with respect to the kind of functions or with respect to the location this particular office was proximately um, located um uh, with um uh, with this factory in question and therefore we can take the view that The, this office and its employees are covered under the factories act and they don't have to obtain a separate um a, a, a registration under the shops and establishment act so you need to um, so these are the practical aspects that we often um, um have to deal with um as part of our statutes are common so uh, psi is primarily with respect to factories but pf is common gratuity is common to both factories and commercial estates <laughs> even esi so okay um, certain statutes would apply irrespective of whether your establishment is a factory or a shops and establishment one example is um, epf act okay because it talks about social security benefits that would apply nonetheless okay then you have esi act as well um, which will apply to both kinds of establishments um as far as your employees um i mean it will be applicable only to a certain section of employees only those employees who are earning wages up to 21000 per month but it is definitely applicable to both factories and shops and establishment then you have payment of bonus act that act also applies to both factories and establishments commercial establishments okay um where you have to pay a, a minimum statutory bonus um of 8.33% to your employees uh, irrespective of whether you are earning profits or losses you have to pay that amount to the covered employees now of course um, there is a wage threshold there as well only those employees will be covered under payment of bonus act um then the the other statute that is applicable across establishments is payment of gratuity act okay again it's uh, uh, this is a basically a terminal benefit that you pay to your employees in recognition of the services that they have rendered over a period of time so that statute also applies irrespective so these are the statutes that apply to both one statute that uh, applies typically to factories and uh, is not um uh, typically applicable to commercial establishments is payment of wages act okay now payment of wages act basically um, applies to industrial or other establishment this is the expression yeah. used under payment of wages act and if you see that definition that is an, uh, that definition essentially covers factories mines etc of course the state government has been given the power to extend the provisions of payment of wages act to commercial establishments as well and there are around five states that have done this they have extended payment of wages act to uh, commercial establishments as well uh, these are i mean some of them are uh, maharashtra tamil nadu haryana karnataka and there is another state um, also so there is a conflict between the deduction term uh, uh, clauses within the shops and establishments act and the payment of wages act then what happens or has this not been happening okay so uh, if there is a commercial establishment let's say in um, um, maharashtra okay yeah. now you will have both the payment of wages act and the local shops and establishment act applying to you okay now let's say um, this local shops and establishment also talks about certain deductions which you can make from the wages of the employee and similar provisions exist in payment of wages act as well now what will you do which act will um, govern uh, deduction from wages so in that case uh, of course the first step would be to try to harmonize okay uh, both the provisions but if in case um, you are not able to harmonize because let's say payment of wages act says that you can deduct 10 items from wages and the local shops and establishment says you can deduct only 5 items 
okay now there is clearly an inconsistency there and in that case you will apply article 254 of the constitution if i am not wrong um that act, uh, that that provision basically says that if there is inconsistency between the central law and the state law then the central law will be applicable if both of them are operating in the same field right so these are the final nuances that you need to keep in mind often there is a friction between the central law and the state law in which case we apply our principles of ios interpretation of statutes right yeah uh, so thanks that was amazing uh, diksha i'm going to start now taking questions kostub you asked about the law firms corporations or organizations one can join after graduation so kostub i have shared a blog.ibreaders.in article which has been written by abhishek dubey he has been he's a law student in the third year and he's been attending this session and he has combined uh, he has combined a compiled a fabulous list of all the law firms which have an employment law practice so uh, you can just take a look acha anand is saying that kostub feel free to ask if there are any questions and if your question is not answered anand is saying that you can't call on national holidays that's correct anand but you can call on these holidays if you pay the person additional amount there is a condition to do that because you'll see malls have this open right in a mall you can you you will go on a republic day and the mall is not shut so do because they comply with these conditions that they will either pay the person double or pay uh, give a compensatory holiday sometimes there may be a requirement to notify the local authority that these are the days when we will be open so yes. that is how it happens it's not a question of fairness or unfairness it's a question of what is the additional compensation that needs to be paid so if i'm earning every day uh 1000 rupees a day or whatever 500 rupees a day i may have to earn 1000 to come on a republic day yes so uh, again uh, here i would like to add that you will have to see the local laws applicable uh, to your establishment so in certain shops and establishments act it's uh, for instance um, haryana i think is one of uh, is one of the states where you will see that if you are asking an employee to work on a holiday you will have to pay um, basically an overtime rate okay which is right. twice the ordinary rate of wages but then there are certain uh, shops and establishment statutes which do not provide for payment um, to be made if you are asking an employee to work on a holiday in that case you will have to provide a compensatory off okay and in most states that is the provision you have to basically give a compensatory off for asking an employee to work on a holiday so it basically depends uh, on which state your establishment is in the requirement will accordingly vary okay any other questions uh, and we can discuss quickly we have 3 4 minutes and i want you all to share your learnings okay i know that i have taken questions late and that is because we wanted to follow a particular structure so that we can communicate uh to you or what's happening okay uh, anand is asking is there any concept of esop uh, buyback so uh, you want to take that diksha i think you do that very frequently okay so um i think um, so abhyudhe what we can do is i can actually see a lot of specific queries i can yeah. try to take them up after the session um maybe uh, you can share my email address i've answered them but okay okay i've answered them one by one not right over there when they asked because they were asking while we were having a conversation okay. but after that i answered okay so to the extent you need my assistance i can definitely yeah. uh, um okay. yeah. and but um, there was uh, i think one of the questions that was asked was uh, again with respect to career opportunities other than law firms um, mm -hmm. so and that is also one of the questions that we also mentioned that we'll be discussing so i just want to briefly touch upon that um, because we couldn't elaborate uh, on that further so of course um, there is certainly an opportunity available in law firms okay um, for uh, 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 working in the field of employment law then you can also go in house okay but in house again the opportunities are very limited because employment law is a very niche practice normally uh, companies look for a person who is well versed with corporate laws um and that person may not have touched upon employment law in detail but the corporate law professionals are normally preferred over employment lawyers but if you see certain global companies they have a special position of in house employment counsels so if you see uber if you see apple you will um, uh, time and again see their uh, uh, the the vacancies they are notifying they will they will obviously they, they will always uh, look for a person who is 
well versed with employment laws so you need to look out for these global companies okay um uh, their india offices look for uh, in house employment councils other than that there is another interesting opportunity which normally people uh, forget about um is policy making okay now again you have institutions like pirs and vidhi center for legal policy that have a dedicated vertical that deals with employment and labor law reforms so in fact we also work closely with uh, these institutions and try to assist the government in coming up with better um uh, employment laws in the country so that is again a very interesting area lot of research involved there as well and if you are really into research this is one thing you can look out for um then the fourth kind of opportunity that is available to you is international organizations so if you see international can labor you, can you give some examples of these policy related organizations and are, do, do they pay pressures if they are talented trained in it um yes so um uh, as i mentioned vidhi center for legal policy has a dedicated vertical for employment law issues so they uh, not only um send recommendations to the government uh, as to what all changes they can bring in in the existing laws they also draft certain laws um uh, for the government if they receive a project um for uh, for a certain kind of legislation okay so uh, earlier of course remuneration wise uh, these institutions were not very attractive but i think even they have realized the need to have um experts uh working in niche areas um a need to bring them on board so they have uh, in the past one year um significantly increased their remuneration and um um i i won't quote the relevant uh, institution the policy research organization but it the, the difference between its remuneration and uh, and the remuneration that is paid to a top tier one law firm is basically the difference is uh 20 to 30k so um that's that's the difference between the the remuneration it's not very significant also so you can definitely consider these opportunities and then as i mentioned international labor organization ilo also has india offices where it requires people to assist them to 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 come up with the uh, laws and you know uh, provide their advisory with respect to uh, employment statutes across the world so that again is an amazing opportunity you can look out for of course they don't hire uh, freshers they normally look for people who have worked for 7 to 10 years in a law firm or or in a company but yes at a later point you have all these opportunities available okay i'm going to invite everybody to share feedback did you find something new did you learn something those of you who want to under, please share that with us and those of you who want to understand this in greater detail definitely please look at the executive certificate course in industrial and labor laws it's a six month course we initially had a one month diploma which we shortened into a six months course because people wanted to learn things faster so as we started getting some practice on it we could compress the learnings into six months and it's as effective so lawyers hr managers and consultants who want to offer consultancy to startups can all benefit from it and we are discussing these themes in a very huge amount of detail you will do exercises like creating standing orders uh exercises on executive employment agreements severance compensation esop plan creation termination dismissal under standing orders act there are some exercises on posh act you will do all of that okay so i have shared the link online with you uh and so you can go through that and feel free to reach out to us in case you need any you have any questions you can send me a, a mail at abhudaya@ipleaders.in i am just sending my email address so diksha would you want to share your email id uh sure so i could yes it? it's uh, d k s h m a l i k a mm-hmm. 726 yeah at @gmail okay keep me copy it guys that's ideally the best so that we can ensure that nothing is missed okay uh so everybody please share your feedback i've got some feedback from henika and shashi kiran henika there are many people who started consultancy for startups there are hr managers who started that uh, for new businesses and they are doing really well because this is a very very important issue that is faced and a real issue so people can't avoid it so they have to engage a consultant to help out on this 
uh, there are issues around even this thing that you know if you leave your employment uh, designing the employment agreement what is the minimum period uh, employment bonds everybody will ask you for that kind of advice what if somebody leaves earlier what if i sponsor him for a training and then he doesn't come back and stay for a fixed amount of time all that so there are definitely a lot of employment opportunities in this area and uh, we are past 1 o'clock um, and i want to thank diksha that for her for spending time with us and sharing her insights she has been absolutely amazing and she's very knowledgeable diksha all the best uh thank you for being here with us and i'm going to get in touch with you again for more details on on other sessions okay and for invitations to teaching as a guest faculty in our courses thank you so much abhyudeh thank you so much it was thank amazing you. yeah thank you dikshaya bye bye